drawn from a, a full-length book on um, the, the life and career of Mike Torres uh, that will be coming out in June uh, from McFarland Press. Uh, John, and, uh, Mike and John and the, the entire Torres family have been very, very accommodating and have given me a tremendous amount of access to the, you know, just wonderful materials. So this talk is really more in line with what Dr. Chappelle and Dr. Chavez are going to present, which is what does sport mean to the Mexican-American community in, uh, in, in Topeka and in other parts of the Midwest? And I'm going to try to give a sense of that through an examination of the life of Mike Torres. And specifically, I'm going to take us to about the point where Mike signs with the, uh, signs with the Cardinals. Uh, if you want to get more, uh, yeah, pick up the book. It'll be available in June. <laughs> Sorry, I think you give it a nice, nice little plug-in. Uh, to understand Mike Torres and his background, it's necessary to examine the conditions and locale in which he spent his childhood in the Oakland barrio of Topeka. Like the story of many persons of a similar ethnic descent in the, throughout the United States, the tale of the Torres family has ties to both the railroad and agriculture. Indeed, these were the occupational sectors most responsible for drawing Latinos to the state of Kansas. An important start for the discussion comes from the Sunflower State Historical Journal, Kansas History. In a 2002 article, James Liker noted the uh, gaps in the narrative of the territory's racial and ethnic groups. In regards to Hispanics, the story is quite complex and not sufficiently researched. In some parts of the states, Latinos were considered the same as African Americans and faced segregation. Thus, some Kansas-based Spanish surname students shared segregated classrooms and families attended colored wards in local hospitals. Oral histories conducted by researchers have revealed examples of Mexicans not being permitted to uh, eat in certain restaurants, swim in public pools, or utilize local parks. Elsewhere, less formal separation occurred, and some employers and individuals stood up to prejudice and asked their fellow Kansans to give members of this group, quote, a fair shake. Liker, for example, mentioned circumstances in which the Santa Fe refused to comply with state government demands to remove re and repatriate Mexican workers during the Great Depression. Among the most thorough efforts to document the arrival of Latinos in the state of Kansas in the early 20th century is a 1980 project by Cynthia Mines entitled Riding the Rails to Kansas. From the very beginning, Mines noted the impact of railroad labor upon the establishment of Mexican barrios throughout the state. Quote, if the Mexican colonies in Kansas are connected in a dot-to-dot -dot game, the resulting lines would form an absolutely accurate map of the main line, uh, main, main and branch lines of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe railroads. Since many jobs were seasonal, it was necessary to supplement employment in locales such as the beet fields near Garden City, salt mines in Hutchinson and Lyons, and meat packing in Kansas City, thus creating barrios in those communities as well. By the time that Mike and his siblings were of an age to play competitive sports starting in the 1950s, there was already a substantial and long-standing tradition of Mexican athletics, both community and church base, in Topeka and elsewhere. The chance to play baseball through the Catholic Youth Organization was an important avenue, not only for developing skills on the diamond, but it could also lead to other opportunities. Among these were the prospect of competing against ethnic sides comprised of Irish, Italians, Poles, and others. In this way, the Mexicans had a vehicle with which to demonstrate their individual skills before a wider population, as well as giving talented players a mechanism for entry, eventual entry into American Legion, high school, and industrial leagues. Um, it, is now, it is to a more specific discussion of such offerings that we now turn. Through extant research, it is possible to recount the story of some of the teams, leagues, tournaments, per the, uh, that existed, and they, these provided rest, relaxation, competition, and community building opportunities for Mexican Americans. And again, Drs. Chavez and Chappelle will give you a lot more detail on them. Such endeavors, many of which date back to before 1920, and then the expanded opportunity to remain in school and participate in scholastic athletics in the post years, in the years post World War II afforded Mike with a fertile training ground to develop his abilities and made it possible for him to come to the attention of Major League Scouts, also known as Bird Dogs, by the early 1960s. The Torres family came to Kansas seeking refuge from the violence of the Mexican Revolution, as well as an opportunity to earn a better living. In many ways, their story is very representative of many of the tens of thousands of Mexicanos uh, in the first decades of the 20th century. 
Mariano Torres, Mike's paternal grandfather, was born in León, Guanajuato, and crossed into the U.S. via Laredo in March of 1911. There, he was recruited by an enganchista, or labor recruiter, and eventually moved to Pauline to work, initially as a laborer, a railroad laborer. By the time he arrived in the Sunflower State, Mariano was already married to Refugio Valdivia. The pair would have a total of 10 children, five boys and five girls, and one of them, Juan Torres, uh, born June 26, 1911, arrived just months after the family came across the Rio Grande. The early life story of Mary, Mike's mother, in, and her family is very com comparable. Her father, Calixto Martinez, hailed from San Julián de Lobos, Jalisco, and was born in October of 1992. He married Concepcion Marquez in October of 1910. The couple had 11 offspring, with the majority of the Martinez children being American citizens, though Mary was born in Mexico in May of 1921. The family crossed into the U.S. in April of 1922, and not surprisingly, both of Mike's grandfathers worked for, the Santa, worked for the Santa Fe Railroad. Mary and Juan had a very interesting courtship. They actually married without ever having gone out on a formal date. And again, if you want to, if you want a, a, a lot more information on that, you, you, you know, you can need, you need to look at my article in the. Uh, in Kansas history or, or look at the book, but they married in April of 1938. The Torres had a total of eight children, three boys, John, Mike, and Richard, and five girls, Ernestine, Evelyn, Mickey, Stella, and Yolanda, and Mike was their fifth. The family lived at 208 North Lake Street in Oakland, at first renting, but ultimately purchasing the domicile in part because Juan received a small settlement from Santa Fe when he lost an eye as a result of an industrial accident in the 1940s. As the various children grew, they attended public schools, first State Street Elementary, then Holiday Junior High, and finally Topeka High, except for Richard, who was given an opportunity to play basketball at Hayden High School, which is a Catholic institution. While the barrio provided a warm, familial environment with plenty of relatives and children to play with, the Torres offspring were not immune from confronting some of the discriminatory practices that existed in Kansas at that time. Research by scholars has documented the myriad difficulties the Mexicano populace in this neighborhood faced. While the barrio dwellers in Oakland did tough physical labor that others did not wish to do, they also endured low wages, limited educational opportunity and economic opportunities, and segregated facilities. As one historian noted, quote, in virtually every Kansas town and city, Mexican and Mexican Americans remained segregated in movie theaters and were restricted from some sections of city parks, <coughs> excuse me, churches, and other public facilities. Sport was one area where there was segregation. Uh, and, and very often, whites did not choose to play sports against Mexicans. One, uh, Mike and John's uh, father, for example, was an avid baseball fan and player. But Mary recalls that he seldom had a chance to play on the diamond against whites. Mostly, teams of Mexicanos in this part of Topeka played at Santa Fe and Ripley Parks and almost exclusively competed versus squads of other Mexican-American communities such as from Kansas City and other parts of the Midwest. Other members of the family, for example, Juan's younger brother, Perfecto, also played baseball. While not given many opportunities to challenge the majority population, this, that generation of the Torres has passed down a knowledge and love of the game to John, Mike, Richard, and they benefited greatly from their expertise. Perfecto helped both John and Mike with their pitching technique and cautioned the boys against throwing curves before reaching a certain age. Juan was also an excellent boxer who did, on occasion, fight white pugilists. As a result of the older generation's love for sports, the brothers were encouraged to pursue a plethora of athletic activities. They did it all. They hunted, they played baseball, they played football, they played basketball. Because of this support and the younger generation's athletic abilities, all of the Taurus boys had educational and other opportunities not common to the broader Mexican-American population during the years before the Chicano movement of the 60s and 70s. By the time of Mike's birth in 1946, baseball and basketball teams were already an established part of Mexican-American life in the region. And again, Dr. Chappelle and Chavez will give a lot more background on that area. For the Torres boys, the variety of athletic endeavors provided an outlet for youthful exuberance, local pride, and for Mike, eventually led, the chance, led to give him a chance to play baseball in the grandest stage of all, the World Series in Yankee Stadium in 1977. 
Beyond the plethora of these community-based sports, the years after World War II also witnessed expanded prospects for Mexican youths to play high school and citywide programs in sport. This was due in part to increased agitation by returning veterans to improve conditions for their hijos and hijas in the public schools. As more and more of these estudiantes reached high school, some found their way onto the gridiron, to the diamonds, and to the court. Mike Torres and his older brother John took full advantage of some offer of these offerings, excelling in various sports at Topeka High School. Now, Juan taught his sons how to throw, catch, and hit, and sometimes took them to see professionals in action via the games of the local Class A team, the Topeka Reds. One of Mike's recollections was that he won a pitching contest staged by the club, and Jim Maloney, the, the local team's uh, star pitcher, encouraged him and gave him tips on, uh, on how to improve his delivery. Further, Juan managed his boys in the Cosmopolitan as well as Little Leagues and gained a great reputation as a wonderful coach, even guiding his, char his charges to citywide titles. Now, contrary, by this time, contrary to Juan's experience of having to play exclusively against Mexican teams during the 20s and 30s, by the time he started coaching in the 50s, John recalls, there were no, quote, ethnic teams in the youth leagues in Topeka. Quote, everybody signed up in grade school and players were divided up into teams. It turns out that Juan Torres proved very popular with his charges, not just because his teams were successful, but according to John, whether the team won or lost, they always made sure that the, all the kids had ice cream at the end of every game. Guaranteed to make you very popular. <laughs> all right. Beginning in 1964, John was also a part of a local Mex group of Mexican-American leaders who commenced a baseball tournament in Topeka. And there's others in the Midwest. Not surprisingly, the Torres clan, because of their athletic activity, uh, and the team that they had, which was called the Seven Ups, was dominant in that competition, with John and Richard both helping to lead the squad to an impressive number of victories in the 70s. Mike also played on behalf of the squad after he turned professional right after high school. In an ironic twist, by the late 1970s and into the 1980s, and we were actually just talking about this as we were having breakfast this morning, um, due to intermarriage and other social changes, many whites were asking for the opportunity to play in some of the very highly competitive Mexican or Hispanic leagues. This created a very important and I think significant debate among John and some of the other folks who started this league. Because are we going to let these folks play or are we going to continue to have simply a Mexicano league? John was one of the organizers who argued that with so many individuals, including many members of the Torres family, who were now the offspring of mixed ethnic relations, that it made perfect sense to have a number of, quote, non-Latinos, or even, you know, half of uh, the, the, the individuals of half, of half Latino background. When some whites continued to complain to John, he pointedly reminded his fellow athletes that, quote, now you guys know how we felt back in the 1940s in 1960s, in 1950s. Now, Mike made a name for himself playing baseball in local leagues in and around Topeka during the 50s. He played Cosmopolitan, Little, Colt, and eventually moved to play higher caliber American Legion with the Topeka Caps. When Mike took the mound, he got noticed, and not just because of his six foot four stature. I actually got to say, Mike is one of the few people that I actually have to look up to since I'm six three. So, I, <laughs> so I, 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 that's a very unusual thing for me. John recalls that it was not uncommon for his younger sibling to strike out as many as 15 or 16 hitters per outing, and this led to another concern, that of being overworked, uh, the overworking of a potential professional uh, prospect. Now, Juan and Mary, uh, through many years of diligent work and toil, had, by the early 1960s, provided a modicum of success for their families. They owned their own home, as well as an adjacent lot. Juan had also been promoted over his years of service to the Santa Fe beyond common laborer status, and he became a coach carman working on upholstery. While a step or two above many friends and neighbors, such assets did not radically alter the family's financial wherewithal. Professional baseball, however, provided an opportunity to utilize the love of the game, Mike's innate talent, into a transformative event for the Torres. 
In the months after high school graduation, Mike and his family worked to make this dream come true. Um, a bit of advice that Mike got in, uh, uh, from one of his uh, uh, American Legion coaches, I think, was very uh, important, very uh, salient in this area. In a 1978 interview, Mike recalled that one of his coaches, Marvin Bonjour, advised him to look at pitching as a job. Quote, when you go out there to pitch, think of dollars. Just think of every game that you pitch, you are pitching with a purpose. In other words, take it seriously. Now, the prospect of trying out for a major league organization was a chance to impact positively both the personal and financial circumstances of the Torneses. Even before free agency, uh, uh, e even non non frontline starter, non frontline non stars, uh, made a decent living. Uh, Bob Hartzell, in a 1967 article in the, uh, the local paper, said, "Quote: Mike will probably draw somewhere around twelve thousand dollars from the Cardinals next year. The two friends he was with Tuesday night don't make that much between them." Now, shortly after high school, Mike reported that the Cardinals reached out to the, the Torres and asked them to come out for a tryout. To pursue his professional aspirations, Juan, John, and Mike traveled to uh, Sportsman's Park in St. Louis, and it was there that Mike first interacted with several well-known baseball personages. Uh, Bob Euchre caught him. He was a uh, 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 branch. Ricky came out to uh, to to, uh, to to talk about uh, his potential. Very interestingly, Branch Ricky. Uh, thought that Mike was Indian or Native American because he said, I've never seen a very, such a tall Mexican. And it's very interesting to think about that because just two years earlier, there was a gentleman by the name of Hank Aguirre, uh, who, is Me who was Mexican from Michigan, who pitched for the Detroit Tigers and actually was a, was a star for the Tigers. So uh, in, in the book and in some of the other research that I've done, I develop this sense that it is pretty commonly accepted that Mexican, Mexican Americans are not good athletes. So that's, that's part of what I see going, going on here. The combination of innate talent, citywide, scholastic, and Mexican American based athletics, as well as the contribution of family members, helped make it possible for Mike to leave the Oakland Barrio and eventually reach the majors. How far he had come since his childhood days. Upon making the St. Louis roster to start the 68 campaign, Mike recalled, quote, My father had only one eye, and I was throwing so hard by age 10 that he couldn't follow the ball. So the catching chores were turned over to John. Shortly after signing the dotted line with the Cardinals, he was off to Hollywood, Florida for a couple of weeks of instruction and with other recent signees of the organization. Today, much of the Torres clan still lives in the Topeka area. John. Uh, who is now retired from Santa Fe, and his sister Ernestine, his sisters Ernestine, Mickey, and Yolanda still reside there. John was active in Mexican softball scene in the Midwest until the early 2000s, and again, that's part of what my fellow panelists will discuss, and is considered to be one of the legends of the sport. A recent paper presented by Professor Chappell uh, it, it noted that one of his interviewees, Gil Solis, remarked, quote, you have to understand that when I was younger, my heroes were not Mickey Mantle or those major leaguers. My heroes were Johnny Boy Torres, Rocket Rocha, and Blanco Gomez. The efforts that familias like the Torres began back in the 1920s continue to bear fruit. And although not in the same format, no longer exclusively Mexican-American, they continue to be an important part of Mexican-American life. Both Juan and Mary have passed away. Juan died in 96, and Mary died recently in 2014. Until the day she died, she continued to live in the family's domicile at 208 North Lake Street. Now, Mike's career, part of what I find very interesting about Mike's career is that Mike, in the eyes of a lot of individuals, is known mostly because of the pitch against with Bucky Dent in the, the playoff game in 1978. But I would argue that his career is much more significant than that. He's at the intersection of free agency, plays with Kirk Flood. Um, I would argue that Mike Torres is Fernando Valenzuela, actually before Fernando Valenzuela comes, comes onto the scene. Now, depending on how one defines the term Mexican-American, it can be argued that Mike is the individual of that background who is the most, the winningest pitcher in the majors. Of, of Mexican descent. Now, 
The only person who's got more wins than Mike of Mexican, and I use that in quotation marks, is Lefty Gomez, 189 and 102 with a 649 winning percentage. But here's